welcome to our international conference, The Future of Europe, the 11th edition, that this year uh, will be exclusively online. Uh, I, I uh, will start directly by inviting the vice rector of the academy of our university, Professor Dorel Paraskiv, to address the, the, the words uh, on behalf of the, of the uh, management of the institution, that is the host institution of this event. Professor Dorel Paraskiv, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Christy. Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for inviting me. Uh, dear students, dear partners, dear colleagues, distinguished guests, I am very happy to address you the welcome speech of the 11th edition of our international conference, Future of Europe, organized by our university and specifically by the Faculty of International Business and Economics. Unfortunately, we do not have the opportunity to host you in Aula Magna and in our uh, premises, uh, but uh, I'm absolutely positive that we'll have a fruitful uh, debate uh, online uh, this year. Uh, as you noticed in our uh, conference uh, program, uh, the organizers um, prepared very interesting uh, chapters of the conference related to current issues we have nowadays, uh, not only in Romania, but uh, also in Europe and uh, worldwide. Uh, each faculty in our university uh, has this opportunity to organize such a conference and our executive board encouraged uh, uh, each uh, faculty uh, to have um, strong corporations, not only with researchers, but also with the business uh, environment. We are uh, currently running different projects uh, aimed to develop the partnership uh, we have uh, with the business environment and researchers in international business and economics. And I do hope that during this conference, we will have the opportunity to exchange on current uh, issues and topic and to contribute to the development of our society. I would like to thank the organizers of this uh, uh, event, to the team of the Dean of the Faculty, uh, Christy, Geo, Roxana, and uh, all of our, my colleagues involved in, in this uh, conference. But also I would like to, to thank to our sponsors who are with us every year and who provide us uh, all the necessary um, support. So thank you very much. Uh, good luck on the behalf of our rector, Professor Istudor. Good luck on the behalf of our executive uh, team and have a fruitful conference. I will pass the floor to the Dean of the Faculty, Professor Hurduzel. Thank you. Uh, Distinguished guests, dear colleagues, teachers and students, in the name of Faculty of International Business and Economics, welcome to the 11th edition of our conference, The Future of Europe. I think the, our conference has become a brand. It is the only conference in, in your country that debates every year the future of Europe. It's a special time. Now our conference will be only online and we hope next edition will be normally um, uh, and fearesque conference. Uh, it's a, it's a, hard to say and special now the future of Europe. How did we predict that the first edition that the future of Europe will look at the 11th edition? We have no idea of what would happen in 10 years. The conference, this conference, as you can see, has five plenary sessions. Two session debates the pandemic issues. <coughs> Another, as you can see, refer to the European Green Deal 
the consumer protection and financial services economics of family uh, European perspective. I want to thank first of all the organizers who made the connection today possible. Thank you to all participants from the country and abroad, to Minister Kutsu, to, Minister, to Mr. <coughs> Mureșan, to Mr. Huslaru. Thanks to colleagues, professor from our university and foreign universities. Thanks to the PhD students, thanks to the sponsors. I wish a lot of success and uh, I end with a motto that said anyone to know the past can understand the present and can shape the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I want also to address a few words uh, on behalf of the organizing, organizing committee, on behalf of our, uh, our uh, persons that were deeply involved to make possible this, uh, this uh, very important event. First of all, I'm very happy and I'm very glad that this event uh, did, uh, didn't stop didn't stop because uh, uh, as you as you see the, the times are not not so uh, appropriate for uh, for uh, academia for schools and uh, uh, in in this case uh, uh, our our efforts were were double were double than a normal event and uh, we have we hope that connection with our community will uh, uh, will go very well so uh, this event will be transmitted uh, almost entirely on the on the Facebook, on the uh, YouTube channels that were announced by uh, by our uh, uh, our faculty, and of course, as uh, as uh, Mr. Pro uh, Vice Director and Mr. Uh, Dean already said, this conference uh, uh, has a very very. Uh, significant history the first edition of this conference uh, was in 2006 uh, before the integration of uh, Romania in European in the European Union so we started this conference as a forum for uh, for uh, scientific debates addressed to European path of our country and uh, year by year the quality of uh, debates the quality of presenters uh, significantly increased. Today, this conference, as uh, Mr. Dean uh, said, it's a brand. It's a brand in Romania. Uh, and uh, today, uh, we can see that uh, in the framework of this scientific conference, we have the possibility to discuss the most uh, uh, important current problems uh, related to this integration process. Two years ago, we discussed about uh, Romanian presidency uh, and the challenges of this of this opportunity for our country. Uh, last year, we discussed about the rule of law and the importance of the rule of law for uh, for our our development as a as a developing country. And today, this this uh, edition, uh, we concentrated our discussions on the Green Deal problems. And of course, how how we can uh, transform this this uh, very important issue into opportunities for for us. And of course, we added other uh, uh, very important top topics. Um, most of them connected with the current situation of uh, pandemic crisis. And uh, we we will discuss about entrepreneurship. We will discuss about education uh, during this this uh, this uh, situation. Uh, as, a, as I said, I'm very happy that the event uh, is still possible uh, this year and uh, I hope that all the participants will enjoy uh, this, this uh, very special event that is an academic event and uh, you will find a lot of things to debate, a lot of things to add uh, as comments, as questions uh, to the, to the uh, panelists, to the uh, professors that were invited to uh, to uh, present their ideas. 
this is a form this will remain uh, for the future also a very important form of ideas and uh, as as my colleagues said we are encouraging everybody to join us and to to uh, to discuss uh, the most important uh, issues about european integration that is not a simple process at the end i want to to thank to the to the sponsors of our of our event uh, that uh, provided uh, an important financial support for uh, making possible this uh, this event and i want to mention uh, Czech Bank, I want to mention MasterCard, I want to mention PricewaterhouseCoopers, Provident, Jidvei, Fertilia, and Romanian Airport Services. All of them were mentioned on our agenda. And uh, of course, we really appreciate their their uh, uh, connection with our, our event. Of course, we have some academic partners that also joined us. Uh, and I want to mention Academia, I want to mention uh, European Institute of Romania. I want to mention a few institutes from uh, Romanian Academy Institute for World Economy, Institute, of, uh, the Institute of uh, Financial Research from, from uh, Romanian Academy. And I want also to mention uh, the, the Institute of uh, Economic Forecasting. And finally, the media partner of this event, that is Profit.Raw. That is a very, also a very important uh, platform uh, for us to uh, help us to disseminate what we will discuss here. Uh, many thanks for uh, for uh, the the, uh, the the management, the board of our university and the board of our faculty uh, that also uh, provided a very important support uh, for for uh, for us. And I want also to to provide a very special thank to all my uh, all 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 the team that were uh, that was involved uh in in this event all my colleagues that today uh are involved in this event as moderators as uh, keynote speakers uh, and also uh as uh, panelists so uh, i hope that this event will be a very very uh uh important one as uh it uh, it was in the in the last uh, last years thank you everybody and now it's time to move to the first section, plenary section of our panel uh, that will be moderated by uh, Roxana Voiku, our colleague Roxana Voiku. And also, uh, I want to, to, to invite you to join us uh, using the, the uh, YouTube channels, Facebook channels mentioned in the agenda of this event. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, uh, Professor Dorel Paraskiv, the Vice Rector of the University. Thank you, Professor Gheorghe Hurdezeu, the Dean of our faculty. And of course, thank you, Roxana, for your technical support, because uh, in this time, this is very, very uh, vital for, for us. Thank you very much. Uh, as scheduled, the plenary um, with uh, the Minister of Finance, uh, Mr. Siegfried Mureshan and Mr. Dragos Puslaru, uh, is uh, scheduled to start at 10. Therefore, uh, in the next 15 minutes, uh, we shall be um, on a technical break, so to speak. Uh, how long has it been since you've seen technical breaks? Thank you very much, Vice Rector Dorel Paraskiv, uh, Dean Gheorghe Hurduzeu, and Vice Dean Christian Pohun. Uh, I shall meet everybody back online uh, at 10 joining the Minister of Finance. Get your questions ready. You can ask either on the Facebook page of the faculty or on the YouTube page of the faculty. Uh, make sure that you have an account in order to uh, comment and ask questions for our panelists. Also, make sure that you direct the question to somebody who you would like to, to answer. And if you post a comment, we would appreciate if you would use your real room. That being said, see you in 15 minutes at 10 a.m. Thank, Thank you. you.
Good morning again for the first plenary session of the 11th edition of the International Conference, The Future of Europe. I'm Roxana Voikutorobanzo. I'm an associate professor with the International Business and Economics Faculty in the Bucharest University of Economic Studies. I'm also um, executive director of the Center of Excellence in Foreign Trade. And today I have the pleasure of joining in a conversation, firstly, Minister Florin Kutsu, the Romanian Minister of Finance. And uh, Mr. Kutsu, thank you so much for taking the time in these days for, uh, for this conversation. Um, your topic towards this idea about the European Green Deal was fiscal policy and economic recovery, which sounds a little bit like a paradox because some say that you can't do fiscal proper fiscal policy, which would mean in some cases austerity and um, proper recovery in case of a crisis. We are also joined this morning by Dragos Puslaru from the European Parliament. Uh, Dragos is, firstly, I'm going to start, he's a graduate of our faculty which is obviously in this conversation the most important thing. He's also the coordinator in the European Parliament of the uh, Renew Europe Committee for Employment and Social Affairs, because the European Green Deal is also about the people. So we will start the conversation with Minister Kutsu about the tools, the fiscal tools towards recovery. Uh, Mr. Kutsu, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, this is a, a great challenge for fiscal policy these days. Um, to you know, it, it has to come to the rescue. Um, we know in a previous crisis, if we look back in uh, 2008, 2009, it was monetary policy. Uh, but the nature of the shock this time around, it's a bit different. And that's why uh, fiscal policy seems to be. Um, the natural tool uh, to fight right now. Um, there's, you know, different things happening in Europe right now and in Romania besides the um, uh, coronavirus crisis. We also have other challenges, you know, have the Green Deal challenge, which is on the table for us um, and, and a few other things, you know, how, how we actually fund ourselves in the future. It's the discussion about our resources. Um, do we put up more um, to fund these uh, short term problems? Um, and I think you know, to, to fiscal policy, it's a little bit of a, uh, a tough tool or a blunt tool to use, you know, to, uh, to actually to, um, uh, to use to, act, um, to finesse the economy. You know, use fiscal policy to, to solve, um, you know, problems uh, in the short term. But fiscal policy, I would see it more of a, a benchmark in the economy. I see the fis fiscal policy as, you know, as something that you set up and then the economy moves around it. You know, it is like a lever. You can always play with taxes. And I've seen the back in the past that people play with taxes. They increase them, they decrease them. But pretty much the economy, because other rigidities remain in the economy, um, nothing happened. So I have a different view on, on fiscal policy than uh, my predecessors. I think uh, what we've done this year with fiscal policy was a natural thing to, um, to you know, to replace uh, the domestic private uh, demand or international demand for goods, private uh, demand was replaced with um, public demand. It was a natural um, thing to do, and it came, you know. And I think that uh, we've seen that pretty much in Europe. Well, tools or the way we disperse this or the way we implemented this demand it was different in every country um, because that's specific to each economy. Some of the economies are more flexible, some are, are more rigid, and then you have barriers when you try to, um, you know to push money into economy, if there are barriers in the economy, this money will not get to, to the people. And we've seen that we've seen that when we designed the um, uh, our uh, projects. For example, uh, SME invest. It was not perfect from the first day. Uh, that's because not because we didn't want to have this program a success or uh, that we didn't want to give the money to the people. You know, it was just the system that we inherited it had so many barriers inside that um, you know we had to the, tear down these barriers so the money could get the people. For example, um, at the beginning, we were asking for uh, too much collateral, for example. 
uh, because you know that was the, the thing uh, you know and, the, and then in talking to banks and uh, we discussed and he said well this is too much for the current conditions it's you know because the state comes in as a uh, as a, you know as a guarantee then we should uh, work on this collateral uh, for those companies and then we lower the collateral and then it, it worked much faster or we had a condition that uh, people uh, companies that access this type of funds had to keep their employees the number of employees was you know there was a question is it's the same number the same employees is the same number you, you get into some details and then you just say oh, listen we don't care you know you just develop your business we want you to develop your business we want you to invest this money you want you to move forward you know better than us who are the people you want to work with or the number of the people you want to work with you know this is it's up to you so um this is i think this is very important to understand how much fiscal policy can do, but also if you want a fiscal policy to be a success, it also depends on the system it's working uh, within. And, um, you know, it's more than, uh, if we want to have a success and if you want to move to the recovery, it's not just about fiscal policy. It's about redesigning the entire system, the ecosystem that fiscal policy works in, you know, and then, you know, of course, you have monetary policy on the other side, which can come in and give you uh, another push. Um, so I think, Throughout this year, what you've seen is that we designed, a, you know, um, an instrument like SME Invest or um, allowing people to postpone their monthly installments for banks for nine months uh, or other grants or whatever. All those things were designed um, to inject liquidity in the system, uh, and then we had to actually uh, redesign the system to make sure that this money get to the people. Uh, and I think, you know. More, all of those things in the end worked out well. If we look at the SME Invest, it's already up to uh, 20,000, um, I think, companies um, that have access to credit. In Romania, that was another problem. Um, the way we want to move the system in the future, it's uh, we took a decision that hasn't been talked about too much. Um, it's But there was a, um, a systemic problem in Romania with uh, negative capital for companies. Uh, those companies had they're undercapitalized. That was, just, you know, this is how they did business. The problem we saw right now in, in 2020 was that when those companies wanted to access funds, well, they couldn't because they're, you know, <laughs> the financials didn't look very well. You know, you have negative capital. It's hard to trust you uh, in the future. Um, so then we created this through fiscal incentives. And this is where I'm getting to my, my point a little bit. Uh, it took a little detour, but I'm getting to my point. Um, that through fiscal incentive, we want companies to, uh, you know, we want uh, shareholders to, um, uh, you know, in inject capital in their companies. We want them to increase, to, to bring their capitals to zero and then to have positive capital. Um, because an economy with uh, capitalized companies, companies that can fund themselves very easily, it's a strong economy. It's a, an economy that faces shocks better than uh, an economy with companies that just co can collapse immediately at the small, um, smallest uh, negative shock. Because in the end, the objective or what we want to build here, um, and the fiscal policy is just a tool to create incentives, incentives in the economy. That's all we do. We do just create incentives. So it's, we're a benchmark. We know we 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 say this is uh, you know uh, you have resources and how do you reallocate these resources in the economy through incentives? And that's the fiscal what fiscal policy does. But in the end, you want to have a flexible economy that mm -hmm. when faced with a negative shock, resources can move from uh, those areas of the economy that suffer the most to areas of the economy that actually are, are you know, are better or, or they actually they can still continue. And we saw that this year that there's specific parts of the economy like, um, you know, uh, restaurants, hotels, uh, maybe transportation a little bit, that have been, you know, uh, hit harder by this type of crisis uh, this time around. Uh, and there are others that actually uh, improved or they were able to develop their business. What we want is that those resources that uh, get, you know, hit it with his labor or capital that's stuck in um, in areas like, uh, you know, restaurant, hotels, transportation, whatever, and they're not productive there, they can should be able to shift uh, immediately to areas where, or, you know, to other areas in the economy where they can be used productively. And that's pretty much, you know, the, the idea. And that, that this is where the fiscal policy comes in but not just fiscal policy, it's also redesigning the economy to create the incentives. And we did that uh, through this year, throughout this year, through uh, we're using fiscal policy, creating temporary incentives for the resources to move from one sector to the other. And at the same time, we also created incentives um, for production capacity to remain 
intact in most of the economy because you, we we always assumed that it'll be uh, this shock. Um, it, it's you know it's not like no other. It is a very violent direct shock, but it's a very short term shock. And not to you know in order to not be a permanent shock, we wanted the economy to recover as soon as as, as fast as possible. If we would have allowed uh, production capacity to be impaired, uh, you know, if we would have uh, made uh, costs for companies, for example, if we said um, that uh, ten unemployment benefits should have been paid by companies, for example, uh, or if we have not come up with uh, uh, these schemes to allow companies to postpone paying their taxes, etc., then this negative shock, which we wanted to be a temporary shock, would have uh, been a permanent shock and would have had a different uh, uh, path of the economy. So that was from the get-go, that was the idea to just say, listen, uh, it is a negative shock, it's how do you observe it and how do you move beyond it? And to move beyond it, you need to inject liquidity in the system so everybody can uh, remain their production capacity intact. And the other challenge was to have uh, the labor force uh, healthy. That's just a challenge that we didn't actually face in the past. We never you know, thought that we have to keep the entire economy to be healthy because you know you have the production capacity, but then you have to take tools to, to do it. Um, so I think this is where we are right now, and we're moving in this direction. And we've seen that throughout the year, uh, fiscal policy we you know we changed. And uh, on the October twenty fifth was the the date when um, uh, a lot of the things that we um, and on the fiscal side that we implemented were um, um, you know they were actually uh, becoming uh, you know they were, uh, uh, going out. Um, we had to actually prolong some of them. Um, mm -hmm. Not because the economy is not recovering uh, how we uh, expected. It is actually, I think our scenario is the base case scenario. It's just to think that um, some of the parts of the economy need more time uh, to to deal with the, with the issue. That's mm -hmm. the, the area. We, we have parts of the economy that are strong, they're doing well, and they're actually carrying the whole, the rest of the economy, but there are parts in the economy. So the measures we're taking now, they're actually, they're not going to be for the, the whole economy. They're going to be uh, targeted on those different sectors of the economy. They're actually uh, struggling a little bit uh, and they're, they're coming from behind. But, you know, if I look at unemployment numbers, we had today, uh, uh, the um, Statistics Institute has published the unemployment numbers. And, you know, September is another uh, month when unemployment um, uh, is lower. Um, so that shows that, you know, even in this with this negative violent shock, we're able to create uh, jobs a little bit, you know, it's 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 uh, it's bad, um, but we're getting where we're uh, we're hoping to be, uh, or hoped to be uh, at the end of the year. Um, so I think this is how we see the fiscal policy. This time around, they had to be to come quick to to create incentives to allow uh, liquidity to be in the system, liquidity to move uh, fast to the to the system. We you know we paid invoices to the uh, to the private sector, the private sector paid back to the to the government etc um and i think the the main difference romania had with other countries was that we didn't close down the entire economy there were actually when we, we, we had the lockdown in romania it meant that construction sites for example uh they were ne never closed and that you know uh, helped us and that's why in uh, the first half of the year we had um, uh, gross fixed capital formation contribution as positive to the dynamic of the economy as actually the only country in the eu and that's where it came from. We just didn't close down construction and then injected. Uh, we kept those uh, investments uh, going. Um, so basically, we learned a lot uh, from this period. Uh, we didn't know uh, exactly what would work and what would not work. Um, but one thing I knew for from sure from the first day, the lesson learned from the, the other crisis, the one I lived through, the 2008-2009, and the one I studied, the one in 1929, that you need to inject liquidity in the system. The system needs to be liquid. You need you need to have you know solvable companies. If you allow companies to go bankrupt and to go insolvent, then you actually collapse in the entire system. So you need to, you needed to keep the the economy going, uh, to keep the production capacity going. And you know it looks like yeah, this is this actually was the the solution. And we're gonna continue this way. I'm I'm gonna stop here. And I'm gonna let you put. Uh, Mr. Kutsu, I'm gonna add to the stream, uh, Mr. Siegfried Mureshan. <laughs> Okay. the European Parliament. He's the vice chair of the EPP group and also the rapporteur on the European Green Deal. Thank you, Mr. Moresham, for joining us. Um, 
Before jumping into, into your presentation, I would like to remind the audience that they can ask questions on our Facebook page and on our YouTube to please use their uh, names and uh, direct the questions. And guess what? We have a first question for Minister Kutsu. Um, and it comes from, from Christian Poon. I'm going to put it on the screen. Uh, the European finance project, including the Green Deal, involved co-financing from the budget. In the past year, we were many times forced to postpone some big projects due to the lack of financing. How important is the fiscal policy in this case? Can we change the fiscal strategy in the future in order to absorb more accelerated uh, these funds? Well, well I think uh, we showed our intention of um, absorbing more funds when we built the budget for uh, 2020. Um, and I, I, I'll just give you the example for investments. Um, yeah, we have 5% uh, of GDP were allocated for investments this year. And we, you know, very good track record. Um, I mean, historical numbers, we actually invested more than uh, anything has been done in the last first nine months, the last 10 years. But um, we allocated half of the money from EU funds and half of the money from the, from the local budget. Um, and the execution after nine months, it shows 40% from EU funds, 60% from um, uh, EU uh, budget, 6% uh, from local budget. So um, basically, we're going in that direction. The idea is, and what we're working on with right now with the um, resilience and the recovery plan, and also the next exercise, and you have here the two, two experts uh, on those EU funds, but the idea uh, for us is to use all the 80 billion you know those are those are resources for the budget they're cheaper than other resources yeah and you know if i can use these resources um, for for the budget to fund investment uh, for example uh, then that means that i lower the pressure on, on the local budget i can uh, continue the fiscal story that i have and i don't have to worry about taxes and uh, you know revenues to increase the revenues also um, i don't have to um, you know uh, i can use the local budget for other uh, other uh, projects, uh, you know, social projects. So basically, this is the uh, the idea. We're moving uh, towards uh, using the EU budget for uh, you know all the EU budget money. Some of them are grants, some of them are loans, but they're actually a very good uh, interest rate. And some of them are just uh, non-refundable funds. So we have all those areas, um, and this is uh, this is the plan. This year, for example, the uh, Ministry of Transportation has spent in the first nine months 3.9 billion ron. Um, on infrastructure, on investment, but 3.6 billion of those are uh, EU funds. So this is basically just showing how we're moving in, in the, this direction, trying to uh, to attract all the all the EU funds that uh, that are available for Romania. Because you know, otherwise, it's it's a shame anyway. You have this money allocated for Romania, their money that uh, you know they've proven that if you use them right, they have the the highest you know um, uh, return. So it would be stupid not to use them. This is just really um, um, our plan to, and that's how we're going to build a budget for next year. We're actually going to get more uh, investment will be, um, a bigger part of investment will be uh, related to the to EU funds. Uh, and we'll move you know, uh, forward this way. Mm -hmm. um, I have a couple of questions from the international debate around the topic. Um, obviously, the EU has infused a lot of money, and you've mentioned the, the 80 billion. The, the question is, what about the debt, which is globally increasing? It's not just a Romanian issue, uh, although, you know, some might prefer to, to focus it on Romania, but it is a global issue. What do we do with, with that? Well, first of all, I wouldn't say Romania has an issue. Uh, Romania is, has one of the lowest um, uh, debt per GDP um, in the world, not just the EU. We are below the average for the emerging markets, um, or we're moving at, at the average for the emerging markets. Um, but you know, if I look at uh, what's happening in the EU, so you know, it is a, it's an issue globally. But this year, the average. Um, debt per GDP in EU, it's increasing with 20%, 20 percent, 20 percentage points of that, 20 uh, percentage points of GDP, not 20 percent. In Romania, it's seven percentage points. Uh, so basically, we're you know more uh, conscious. We know our that is going to be um, we'll get, this money have to be paid back. We know that uh, these are money that are borrowed. We're aware of all that. In the same time, uh, it is the best alternative uh, short term. Uh, you need the revenue. To pay for healthcare uh, investment right now, you need the revenue to to steer the economy to to take it over this. 
And the way you pay it back for it, and we showed, and actually even Romania showed that other countries showed you could pay it back. It's by having a, a target and economic growth um, that's higher, so it's, it's more dynamic than the interest rate you borrow with. So you can actually pay it back, uh, but if you have to, you'd have to target that economic growth. And if I look at numbers um, right now, uh, how they see Romania developing in the next year, I'm not talking about our view. I'm talking about the international uh, IMF, whatever, European Commission, international economists. They all see the average growth of Romania for the, over the next few years to be uh, above 4%. That's, you know, if you grow above potential, then we can pay it back. Um, so you have to keep this uh, this dynamic it is in my view it is uh, a cheaper and a, a better source um, to fund your uh, current uh, expenditures than the alternatives the alternatives will be not to do these expenditures or to increase taxes if you want to increase taxes now and then you'll kill the economy and then you just you're dead uh, so that those the alternatives are terrible uh, and that's why nobody uses them and whoever thought, you know, of increasing taxes in, in 2010 and 2009, we saw that this just this is really bad uh, policy in these times uh, right now, uh, when the economy is recovering. We saw actually the last three years, the previous government increased taxes when times were good, when uh, you know, and they still uh, damage the economy. So this is not a solution uh, for to fund, uh, you know, the, those projects right now. Um, we also, you know, uh, think because there's a fiscal golden rule you know to, to borrow for investment and that's pretty much what we try to do this year um you know to, to, to most of our borrowing was try to tackle to uh, to challenge it for investment so you have the return better than uh, the interest that you borrowed uh, with so all those things are in our strategy when you, when you think about it um at the same time as i said we are uh, we are i think i want to say conservative but we are um more aware of our situation in the world, and that's why we're, you know, we're, we're going slower than everybody else. You know, if you also look at how much the the deficit increase in Romania estimated deficit is the smallest increase in EU. There's, you know, most of the EU countries are increasing their deficit by 11 percentage points or 12 percentage points. We're gonna go only relative to what we targeted at the beginning of the year with only five percentage points. So it is, mm -hmm. and this is not just the data I say. It's pretty much it's out there. It's public data. Uh, linking a little bit to the research that took place within the within our faculty within our university uh, regarding the Romanian connection the Romanian economy's connection to the other economies in the world uh, we are sort of vulnerable because we are smack into the middle of the value chain um, not a lot of the the sectors in Romania are placed in a situation in which they're not dependent on others. Um, this reduces our resilience on the one hand. On the other, in case of a new lockdown, which we see is starting to happen, how do you think the fiscal policy can support this vulnerability of the, of the Romanian economy? Because you can't switch the, the structure of the economy overnight. Correct. That's, that's correct. And... Uh... You know, when when the hit the shock hits, it hits everybody, and then just it's it, it's the response that matters, not the shock. We have everybody has the same shock. I think our strategy it is not to go towards a lockdown anymore. Um, or trying to we need to do everything to have the economy open as much as possible because you need to pay for the the costs of the you know the healthcare and everything that is happening in the economy right now. Um, we've seen that the solution and. You know, we have to look at what happens to financial markets in March last year, when they all just shut down immediately, and you know the government scrambling to fa uh, to find money to you know actually to for current uh, expenditures. We had a buffer and we we're fine, but still, the so what happened then is just uh, uh, it can tell you what can happen if everybody locks down again. That's you know locking down or, or you know stopping the uh, the financial markets or stopping the source of funding. All of this. Uh, it is um, is dangerous, and I think it's just the only the sure way to go towards uh, bankruptcy. You're right; you cannot change the structure of the economy uh, right away. What we can do, we can actually. Um, um, well, but at the same time, I've seen companies in Romania uh, very fast, uh, you know, uh, switching to the current needs of, uh, of the people. You cannot have you know the, the whole structure. Uh, but there's parts, especially uh, SMEs, that they've been able to uh, 
to change their uh, their objectives for the short term. Uh, also, you had fiscal policy um, coming in, you know, replacing the the private demand. So we did that for you know few big companies in Romania. Um, but this is if this continues if you're right if, if this continues for example if the whole europe you know stays locked down for another year or so yeah, everybody's gonna have problems uh which i think i don't think is gonna be uh the case i think that europe uh you know we've seen that th there, there's lockdowns but i think those will be short term uh with every uh situation i learned a little bit more of how to use in the same time romania is a bit different than other countries because there's still room we talked about fiscal policy a lot but there's still room for monetary policy. In mm -hmm. Romania, still, uh, minimum reserve requirements are still high relative to um, other countries in the EU. Uh, interest rate is still high relative to other countries in the EU. So that means that you still can you have a push from uh, monetary policy uh, to keep you uh, to, to inject liquidity. It's not just fiscal policy. So fiscal policy has done most of the work so far, uh, helped also by uh, monetary policy. But uh, if we look, you know, central bank um has not uh, reached their target of buy of bonds buying from the secondary market um and uh, again um, real interest rates are still positive Romania there's room to go to to zero or even negative so if we need to get there there's still an instrument that we can use going forward so that's why I'm a little bit I think that we you know we entered the situation handicapped with a, a bigger deficit uh, with a structure of the economy that's not uh, you know uh, was was a rigid structure of economy uh Along the way, I think we managed to change things, uh, but the way we responded, it made the difference, I think, this year. And that's always the case. Uh, the shock is the same for everyone. It just depends on how you respond to it. Well, uh, we, we have a couple of questions. Um, obviously, you know, whenever you have the Minister of Finance answering that in a period of crisis, we get questions. Uh, <laughs> They, they relate to uh, the Next Generation EU plan. Uh, they relate to the moratorium for individuals. Uh, so, uh, because I know that you will be joining us throughout the, throughout the panel, I will give the floor to Mr. Siegfried Moreshan to place the conversation a little bit into the European Green Deal as well. Uh, give the time to, to the minister to go through the questions and then we'll, we'll come back to, to the conversation. So we have not forgotten your question. Thank you for it. Uh, Mr. Mureshan, you hold, you hold the important position of being the, the rapporteur for the European Green Deal. Um, and the topic of, of your presentation, as we have scheduled in the agenda, was to talk about the opportunity of funds for Romania. My first question is, linking to what the minister says, are we able to take on all those money? Firstly, good morning. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much for putting this topic on the agenda. Thanks to you and to all of the partners who made this possible. The answer to your question is very simple. It's very easy whether we have the capacity to access those funds. The answer to this question is very easy and I will be very blunt. It depends about who is in, is in charge of managing these funds. If we look at the experience of the last years, we saw that the private sector, that NGOs have always done their job in accessing the EU funds. We saw that local and regional authorities have done their job wherever there were competent mayors and presidents of counties, of regions, money, money was accessed and uh, development came. We saw obviously a problem at the national level with previous governments. We saw very low rates of absorptions for large infrastructure projects. And we are now seeing a fundamental change this year. And the Minister of Finance has already spoken about this. We are seeing large infrastructure programs which had been blocked for years before being unblocked and financing being accessed, highways included. So the truth is, uh, it really depends about who's in charge. It really depends on who's in charge. And uh, the government in charge will need to do many things at the same time in the next three years. Firstly, finish the absorption for the period 2014-2020, where the government um, basically inherited long delays. As you know, we are allowed to access these money until the 31st of December 2000. 
2023. The second thing that the government will have to do is start the programs, uh, define the conditions for the absorption of the new money, 2021, 2027 money coming as of the 1st of January. The third thing will really start this absorption. And the fourth uh, thing, um, do the national uh, recovery and resilience plan to access the new funds that are coming through the um, new European uh, Recovery and Resilience uh, Facility. I can gladly go into all of that. If you want me, I can tell you a few words about the financing of the Green Deal in the beginning, as uh, that was the, the topic that you wanted me to speak, or we can go directly into questions as you prefer. Well, uh, I think that it would help a little bit because um, the audience of our of our conference, uh, considering the fact that it's public on our Facebook page and on, on our YouTube, is not necessarily just academic. So uh, it would help placing the the entire conversation into what does the the European Green Deal funding really encompass. Um, we have questions related to entrepreneurship. We have questions related to, to the recovery. And the minister has also mentioned in the beginning the fact that we also have to consider climate change because we can't you know, push the economy without taking that into consideration. We also have to consider digitalization, which is a, another topic where uh, the European Union is pushing through. So it would help if you would uh, contextualize the the conversation a little bit because I know that Dragos uh, will Dragos Puslaro will also um, discuss about the new economic model, how the next generation EU is really the next generation EU. So. Um, with pleasure, obviously. So uh, where did it all start? It all started with the day of the European elections when we saw people coming out to vote in large numbers, particularly young people, and when we saw in many European countries that tackling climate change, reducing pollution was an issue that really concerned people. And uh, we were tempted to believe that in our country this was not so much of an issue, but I can tell you from many meetings with young people, they know about the topic, they know many details and they care about it. So on the day of the European elections, we understood the result, the high participation, particularly of young people asking uh, for us to tackle climate change, we understood it as a mandate to do more in this area. So immediately after the European elections, um, greening, um, became an important objective at the European level and we have to be very honest, the financing of the Green Deal will decide about its success or, it, or its failure because the transition to a green economy will not be possible without resources. First element. Second element, um, we were um, starting uh, to work on the Green Deal and the financing of the Green Deal when the Covid crisis hit and what I want to say is uh, this um, crisis obviously has an impact upon investments, upon public finances at national and at European level, but the objective of tackling climate change stays. Uh, tackling climate change, uh, modernizing the economy should not be uh, something that we do just in between crises. It should be a daily objective. I will go a bit into details on how we can do it, but what I want to say is the commitment at European level to continue greening the economy stays in spite of uh, this crisis having hit us. Now, uh, what are we doing? We know that the need for investments, um, European and national, public and private, to reach the objectives is between 200 and 400 billion euros per year over the next decade. What are we doing at European level? We are committing through this European Green Deal to spend European public money in the area of 1,000 billion euros in the next 10 years to greening. Where should this money come from? Firstly, from the traditional budget of the European Union. The traditional budget of the European Union is now in the final making. It will be between 1,000 and 1,100 billion euros for the next seven years. And the objective set is that at least 25% of these resources should go into greening and by the end of the seven-year budget, so by 2027, this uh, ratio should be 30%. So you would see between 200 and 300 billion euros going into greening. And here I want to be very clear throughout all areas of financing, in agriculture, 
in research innovation, in financing entrepreneurs, uh, financing the private sector infrastructure, everywhere. So there will not be a special section, money for greening, but uh, our objective is that all of the projects that we finance should as much as possible um, help improve energy efficiency, reduce CO2 emissions, reduce pollution, and help tackle, um, help tackle climate change. This is the first element. The second element is, immediately after the crisis, the European Commission put forward a 750 billion euro uh, recovery package, on which Dragos and myself are now to, uh, together working in the European Parliament as co rapporteurs. 750 billion euros for the whole Union, out of which more than 30 billion euros for Romania. And um, the European Commission said the following, throughout this project, at least 37% of the resources should be allocated to climate mainstreaming, and at least 20% of the resources be allocated to projects which have a digital component. And Dragos and myself in the Parliament, I'm saying this for the first time now publicly, together with the other colleagues, we are proposing the amount for climate mainstreaming to be 40%, a slight increase from the proposal of the Commission, uh, because of the demands of the majority of the colleagues, also our green uh, colleagues, our green group. Um, so we propose 40% uh, allocation for measures which help tackle climate change and 20% for digitalization, while double counting is of course allowed because there are projects which have a digital component and in the same time help the, uh, help the environment. So then of course that investment can be counted in both, uh, in both uh, components because the objective is, you know, modernizing the economy and digital and greening very often go... Um, uh, go helping uh, go go hand in hand uh, the third uh, the third element is uh, the following um, we want the most affected regions in the transition to greening to be helped most so the european commission proposed a so called just transition fund designed exclusively for the regions which are hardest hit by the transition to a green economy so mining regions in romania it's basically six counties uh, um, um, which where you see mining uh, as a very important part of the economy uh, and there money will be allocated not for a transition to a green economy but to support the categories of people most affected and here uh, my view is that money should not go primarily into social programs but into programs which support employment which uh, attract investors and which generate new employment opportunities in those uh, in those uh, in those areas um, so this so-called just transition fund proposed by the european commission will help particularly those regions most affected the european commission there proposed the following and we have managed to change it into the european parliament in the european parliament the commission said that if you want to access resources from this so-called just transition fund you have to match them with resources from your own cohesion policy in a ratio of at least 1.5 to 1 maximum 3 to 1 what i'm trying to say is if you want to access 1 million of this new just transition fund you should at least bring 1.5 maximum 3 million euros from your own cohesion funds this was the proposal of the european commission to increase the firepower of this limited just transition fund we in the european parliament said no because we said the just transition fund is a new project and it should have a large firepower by itself it should not oblige us to allocate into a certain area our own cohesion funds because that would be a de facto reduction of our space of maneuver of our uh, own cohesion policy and it would mean a de facto reduction of our cohesion policy so we in the european parliament have organized the majority which says that the just transition fund should have the firepower on its own that's why we're asking for an increase to 25 billion euros at the european level uh, commission proposed 7.5 billion initially that would have translated into an allocation of about 760 million euros for Romania we are proposing mm, the firepower of 25 billion euros on its own from the side of the parliament then that translates to an allocation of um, about 2.5 billion euros from this just transition fund alone from Romania for Romania not affecting uh, here with the um, the cohesion policy this is a proposal of the parliament the final negotiations between the council and the parliament are now taking place so i expect ourselves to um, to land somewhere in between what else are we doing at european level um the budget of the european union has so far been financed mainly um, by contributions of member states, uh, members of the European Union. So whenever 
uh, a budget for the next seven years needs to be negotiated, the heads of state and government are meeting and it's like a trade-off. Everyone is uh, interested in paying as little as possible, receiving as much as possible. This obviously does not give stability to the budget of the union in the long term. What would give stability? Um, own sources of revenue for the European Union. That's something that the European Parliament has demanded for many years and which naturally the member states of the union are opposing and it's something fully understandable because any member state of the union, any government, any minister of finance would want to collect himself the taxes and to then decide, you know, how much do I pay into the European budget? Um, but um, the good news is that there is now an agreement uh, between the member states and the parliament to make some progress in this area in the upcoming years. And uh, there, obviously, we need to be very careful because any own resource of the European Union should not lead to an additional burden to the final, uh, to, the, to either the final consumer nor the enterprise. But what I want to say and why I mentioned this topic is that by how you design an own resource, you can also incentivize a process of greening. So a tax on a non-reusable plastic is being discussed now at European level. Obviously, we as a country have to see if this is coming, how it is implemented, not to our, not to our disadvantage, but that can also incentivize us, you know, to use less of um, non-reusable non-reusable plastic. Coming towards the end, I would like to say the following. So, um, as I said, uh, many resources will be needed and the European Commission, it was proposing um, uh, the Green Deal at the beginning of the year, with ourselves at European level being able to mobilize 1,000 billion euros for the next 10 years and then, you know, also incentivizing private investments. The leverages which it proposed were something, you know, uh, proposed uh, at the beginning of this year before the Corona crisis hit. So in the report on the financing of the Green Deal, which I was in charge of in the Parliament, adopted at the level of the Budgets and Economic Affairs Committee two weeks ago and to be adopted in the plenary in two weeks' time, we are asking the Commission to reevaluate, reconsider, look again into these leverage ratios because we know, as the Minister has said before, the situation of the national public budgets in many member states of the Union is obviously a tensed one. Many companies are facing um, uh, solvency or cash flow problems and I fully agree with the Minister, you know, we need to keep the companies alive, so yes, they have to make an effort in I mean, two words, greening, but not something which endangers their, their very existence during this period of crisis. So this is why my report in the Parliament asks the Commission to look again into these assumed leverage ratios. So we should continue to be committed to greening, but, you know, we should take into account the unfortunate evolution of the, uh, of the, um, uh, of the economy uh, this year. The European Commission, just one figure, one example, and I will conclude with this, the European Commission uh, proposed uh, uh, proposed uh, some weeks ago that we aim to reduce our CO2 emissions by the year 2030 with 55% in comparison to the year 1990. Initially, our objective was 40%. Now, uh, we say, hey, uh, we do not want to reduce only 40% uh, over the next years, but go to 55. It may sound not a big difference, but in fact, it's a very big difference and a very big effort for, uh, for countries, for regions and for the economy primarily. Um, my political group said, look, we are ready to support this if the Commission uh, comes out with uh, an impact assessment. They came with an impact assessment and we, uh, we support uh, that minus 55%. There is a majority in Parliament who now ask to be even more ambitious, go to 60%. I will not go um, into the politics of this, but what I want to say is uh, um, we have to be ambitious in the next years, but, you know, support, the economy obviously has to make an effort. It's our duty to also support it as a public sector and to make sure that, you know, it can go through this difficult process, modernize, uh, reduce its uh, carbon footprint, but, you know, not be, uh, not be jeopardized in terms of investments and in terms of job creation. Thank you, Mr. Murashan, for this uh, encompassing uh, and really comprehensive contextualization of the of the entire story. It's definitely interesting about this need 
to work together. The all member states, uh, all governments, and to be able to shift over um, their differences. Uh, before jumping back into the conversation, you know, my role as a moderator is to, to keep the, the discussion lively. So uh, considering I have a significant amount of comments for and questions for the minister, uh, I would I would like to give uh, a little bit back the floor to him uh, because the questions also relate to the recovery past the crisis. Uh, what sort of measures do you see past COVID in terms of recovery? In the comments, we have the um, the hint that uh, you have also met with the U.S. ambassador with His Excellency uh, Zuckerman. Uh, how do you see that linkage? And the second question, which is actually a longer uh, pack of three, relates to the uh, launching in public debate of the next gen EU and what from the Romanian government and uh, what would that encompass? So recovery and next gen. Yeah, before I get to the questions, I want to uh, talk a little bit about the uh, Green Deal because at ECOFIN we discuss about um, the Green Deal and uh, I had a few interventions there. A few things that I said then I will stand by. Um, fiscal policy, it is a blunt tool to use uh, in terms of fighting uh, or, you know, pollution. It is something you can start with, but it's, it's a too blunt of a tool uh, to use. We need more than just fiscal policy. I understand the short term, uh, it is a solution, but if you want to steer economies towards being greener, it's not just fiscal policy. It's a bit more than fiscal policy. But we'll start with that. The second thing that I said, and I'll stand by, is that um, when we think about Green Deal for EU, Romania, we need to actually take into account the different conditions of each country. So you cannot ask from Romania the same effort. Well, you can ask the same effort, but not the same pace. So, you know, we'll put our part, which is be on par with every, every other country in the EU, but you, can ask, you cannot ask us on the same pace. It is, it's, you know, you have to take into consideration the specifics of each country when you design the deal. This is something that we will, we, we will keep continuing because, as, we, as uh, Mr. Marshall said and we talked before, um, there are counties in Romania, there's, we have a social problem, a social cost that we have to deal with in the short term, and we want to, you know, spread that cost over a period of time. So this is, you know, it's very important for us when we talk about the Green Deal. And when I go there and I negotiate, you have to know that this is our view. That we, you know, we try to. Um, of course, we we all we have the same objective. This is not. There's no debate about that. We all have a greener. We want a greener economy. We want a greener Europe. Uh, it's just that the way we get there, we don't start. This, we don't have the same starting point. And there's different social costs for each economy. Uh, and then we have to internalize those. And that's all we ask. It's a bit, when you look at it, to be different for each country. And again, fiscal policy, it is a tool that could also backfire when you talk about um, these types, you know, using taxes. Taxes are not uh, a very, uh, a tool to use with finesse, you know, to steer. It, they're actually blunt. And then you could actually distort reallocation of resources if the level of taxes that you use for uh, to, to collect uh, or to discourage um, pollution, if it's too high, then you could actually create other problems in the economy. It's very important to uh, understand how you use taxes to fight pollution and green. But this is something that uh, you know we're still discussing. Now, getting back to Romania regarding recovery or moving past the crisis, which is great. That means that uh, people are thinking past the crisis. I think this is a great sign that uh, you know we're actually looking past the crisis. Um, and as I said, the uh, the fiscal policy in Romania, and because we are, you know, all um, people that understand, I'm going to use this language. Uh, it's fiscal policy in Romania. It is stimulative. It's been stimulative in 2020, and will remain stimulative for 2021 most of the the year. But our aim is to move to a neutral towards the year, and then the idea is, you know, once we get off the get out of the woods, to have a fiscal policy that's acyclical. You know, this is the role, actually, this is the role of a fiscal policy. You know, you don't want to be a pro cyclical uh, story as it was in the past, because then what you do, what you do is that, you know, the economy is growing and actually you're creating uh, false expectations in the economy by pushing money in the, in you know, just pushing money in the economy just to, uh, because, you know, a fiscal policy um, will, um, 
erase all the signals. This is the, the role, you know, where inflation, interest rates, all those things, you actually exacerbate the signals. So that's why you need fiscal policy to be a stabilizer. And the idea for us is, you know, to move from uh, a stimulative fiscal policy in 2020 and 2021 for most of the part, and then to, towards neutral and then acyclical fiscal policy. Uh, the idea, obviously, is to have uh, an economy that, uh, like most of our, the economies in the EU, uh, will have a surplus when the economy is growing above um, uh, potential. So when your, your GDP growth is above potential, we will like to move towards a surplus because if Romania would have been like that, uh, this uh, when it, when the crisis hit, the uh, we would have had a lower cost to go through the crisis. So you know we we want to move to a more of a uh, a normal fiscal policy that uh, it's run throughout other economies in, in EU. Um, so in terms of measures, um, well, we you know most of them. We you know it's we're not inventing the wheel right now. Uh, you know, using guarantees, that's something that every other European country uses. And I think that's a great instrument uh, to help economies. Uh, if you do it in a partnership, a, well, a good partnership with the uh, financial sector that does the ascendment of the funds and everything, then it actually could work. So using guarantees to help companies go through this period, which is, you know, basically you're making companies solvable because the, the government pairs up with them. Uh, that's an instrument they will use going forward. There'll be other, there'll be grants, uh, etc. cetera. Um, you know, there's three measures that we've uh, applied, uh, unemployment benefits that will go uh, continue for those uh, uh, sectors of the economy that will be, uh, uh, you know, their activity will be impaired by the government decision, let's put it this way. Um, uh, there'll be the, um, we're looking again uh, at uh, what happens with uh, monthly installments for um, uh, paying your, for banks, uh, paying the monthly installment to banks. We'll see what the solution we have there. I'm looking at all the instruments we have applied this year to see how we can continue them. So this is, uh, there's no exception here. And in terms of funds, uh, we have good news from uh, from the EU. The SURE program, uh, it's in place. And actually by the end of the year, we'll be able to tap into 2 billion euros from the EU through this, uh, through the SURE uh, fund. Those are funds that, you know, we borrow this money, but they're actually borrowed at the interest rates of the EU, um, plus a, a small um, uh, cost, uh, their borrowing cost um, for a period of 15 years. But those are funds that will help fund our deficit, uh, uh, but linked to labor markets uh, measures. So this is something to maintain the labor markets uh, healthy. So uh, all of those things are in place. I think that, um, you know, it hasn't been in the history of Romania, you know, in the last, you know, at least 30 years, but uh, even history of Romania, a period where we have access to this type of funding. Uh, and it is, uh, I think, uh, and I don't want to get into politics right now, but it is, uh, we'll present this resilience and recovery plan, I think next week, and we'll show in detail uh, exactly where money will go. And I think I don't think anyone has done this so far in Romania and, you know, preparing a plan for this big amount among of money, uh, you're preparing it to the very uh, detail of, you know, projects and, you know, how to apply, etc. And, uh, you know, this is also with the help of our colleagues in the European Parliament, etc. But you will see, um, it will be presented next week. Um, and it, as you know, it will be approved uh, in April next year. But I think this is a, a unique opportunity for Romania um, right now to develop. Uh, and uh, we will not pass this. Uh, I think, uh, you know, we know we'll, we'll be the only ones that can actually carry through uh, this program in the future. But the details will be presented, I think, next week. Uh, or the week after, and everyone will have access to. Uh, and again, you'll be amazed. It's going to be a very detailed program uh, to uh, to attract this next generation EU funds. Mm -hmm. So it it would be kind of a spoiler to go into the details that Mrs. Ikatoyu no. is asking. No, no, I, I think large investment SMEs. You will see. No, you will see that actually um, because I was at the uh, when we went to the to see the pre president uh, a few days ago. That's all the discussion is about and you know we went through every uh program um there's now some uh discussions to include more um uh, for example i think that you know as you know this was a, a plan uh, or the, the next generation you was mostly for public sector this you know the discussion is how you involve the private sector uh, into this and this is is an ongoing and i think with the help of the uh two euro uh deputies there we might uh see how we can actually uh, have the the private sector access some of those funds i mean this is the the whole thing it's uh it's 
dynamic. Uh, it's evolving. And I think we've learned, you know, from the past experiences. Uh, and I think one of the objectives is not to have that situation when uh, you, you do an expansion in Romania and then you go and, uh, to um, have it uh, paid by the EU and they say, well, it's not eligible. We want to erase this situation. This is not going to happen of this problem. So again, you'll see a very uh, detailed program in the next uh, few days um, on that. And all the other schemes that we have in place, they're continuing to, uh, towards the end of the year. Uh, and then I'm working right now to prolong the ones that work best. Um, and uh, the ones that had the better, uh, better return will continue for the, for the next period. I know the EU has also suspended, um, continue to suspend some of the rules that will create um, uh, barriers so uh, it's going to be uh, even for the uh, government help etc um, but this will come in, in the next period we're working on that and obviously um, one thing that we do the recovery and resilience plan um, the sure all of them are tied to the budgeting uh, process they're all tied in with the budget process for next year and for the next year so this is a, the, it's it's an entire package everything comes together uh, with a budget process because you know our uh, contribution to EU, it will be uh, quite substantial in the first part of the, this exercise because, you know, as uh, Mr. Murshan said, we need to contribute to this. And there's also the own resources discussion and all those things uh, that are ongoing. Uh, next week, it's another ECOFIN and there'll be all those things will be on the agenda. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I, I know that uh, Minister Kutsu will have to, to jump out of the conversation at 11 for um, another uh, important thing. And we would like to thank him for, oh. for joining him for this hour. Uh, before, before letting you leave, um, yeah. what would be your um, piece of advice for mm -hmm. entrepreneurs, for individuals, uh, considering we live in uncertain times, uh, considering uh, people fear what will happen, regardless of all the plans of the European Union, that's abstract to a certain extent. We all look at our jobs, at the possibility of you know paying pay, paying back our loans and so on and so forth. So, what would be your piece of advice on the one hand for the for the entrepreneur that does not have a large multinational corporate corporation behind him or her, and to the individuals? Uh, we had a question regarding the um, um, the the, el the elderly, the the ones that have limited income. Well, you know, I think um, I know that people want advice from public officials, but I think we're the worst to give advice. I think uh, people uh, know best to, to what to do with their lives. All I can say is how I uh, managed, uh, you know, uh, Ministry of Finance and how I managed pretty much when I where I worked. Um, because I worked a lot with other people's money, investing and everything, it's usually prepare for the worst and hope for the best. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a risk management uh, strategy, um, you know. Um, to make a joke, you know, the, the Monty Python said, you never, nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. So basically, uh, you need to create a system, uh, and that's in your, your personal life, in your company, uh, for the economy, a system that can face shocks. You know, you never, you cannot forecast when the uh, next crisis is coming. You cannot forecast the, the how big the shock it will be. You cannot forecast those things. What you can do, you can make yourself flexible. Um, and then you can deal with the shocks. You know that's the, the best you can do. You, as I said, it's easy, it's better to have an economy that resources can flow from one sector to the other uh, in, in terms of crisis. Um, that's why I believe in, in simple rules, in, in simple fiscal policy, in lower and uh, lower taxes, but few taxes, but paid by everyone. Um, so this is, you know, otherwise uh, we will do our part not to impair the role of the fiscal policy or, or the way that I see the state is just not to be in the way. Our role is, you know, just kind of step back and let you do what you know how, how to do best. It's, uh, you know, and I think for the next discussion in the future, we'll need to talk about the culture of bankruptcy. Uh, you know, how, how it is important to embrace this and, you know, how to, you know, fall down, get up and, and move on um, uh, a few times if it, if it needed to. Uh, oh, and because you've said that, one very short question. When you mentioned cultural bankruptcy, you know, I can't help it. When you mentioned cultural bankruptcy, uh, Initially, I was thinking, okay, you're talking about the the, um, the the failure thing, but you're also talking about the the bankruptcies that are for the creative industries, right? 
which, which, are, we're, which are going through an unprecedented time right now. Um, what do you plan to do about th that? Because they have a very uh, atypical type of, of um, industry uh, with uh, abnormal, some would say, type of contracts. Most of them are freelancers and so on. So they're not, you know, the, the usual people to go to banks. I think for those, uh, and there's not just this uh, this sector. There, there are other sectors in the economy, especially, you're right, freelancers, independent. Uh, and this is actually the uh, uh, the part of the economy that I... I you know, I love. This is where the next entrepreneur come from. You know, this is what we need to encourage. And uh, yeah, no, we're not United States where um, you have venture capitalists to help them, and then we create programs um, for them. You know, and I think what we'll do. Yes, there's these uh, instruments again through guarantees. But I think um, it is. I have few schemes in in my, in my mind. For example, you know where um, we put in the first buck, for example. But if you manage to bring in private investment next to us, then we double that. Things like that. You know, we want to help you seed money, um, and this is going to be done through a uh, few uh, projects. So, you know, again, you have two Euro parliamentaries there that actually have worked. Also, you know, one of them, Davish Pusar Romania, is very good. He's had the company doing that. So there's few things that uh, we can uh, replicate in the future. Um, but again, I, I see this is uh, for Romania, and we need to change culturally toward appreciating the entrepreneurs, appreciating the ones that the people that try, that take, you know, take risks with their own money, they fail. And then when they fail, they should not, uh, you know, uh, stigmatize them. We should actually embrace them when they fail and encourage them to try again and again and again until they make it. This is where everything is going to move forward. Unless we, um, unless we have this type of culture and we expect the government to choose champions, we cannot move forward. Government, you know, we as you know, now I'm, a, I'm a, you know, uh, I work for the government, so now I put myself in this place, and it's not the role, our role to choose champions. It's not our role to actually. Uh, pick, you know, in the economy where money should go. Our role is to make sure that things, you know, uh, work out there uh, and, uh, you know, everybody follows the rules, etc. We step back a little bit and we intervene, obviously, when things uh, get really bad, like these types of crises, to support demand. But it's a short term, you know, we, uh, we actually we need to just keep things moving. So um, the policy we're, we're having in mind is uh, th those policies is to create instruments for those people, like independent freelancers, etc., uh, to have access to funding when they start their uh, their uh, projects, whatever the projects they are, uh, have a little bit of funding. And if they're successful and they show us that actually private investment comes next to us, matching us, then we'll even match more and we'll move forward. This is the th the things that I see uh, going forward for these types of, uh, of projects. Then you have bigger companies or whatever. This is a bit different. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thank you, Minister. Um, f feel free to jump out of the conversation whenever. Thank you. Uh, I'll listen to Dragos a little bit, uh, just a little bit. Uh, uh, yeah, it, exactly. Perfect. <laughs> Mr. Puslaru. Uh, you know, and some would say Dragos, because we've known each other for, for quite a while. And um, the, the topic of uh, the resilience plan, the topic of the new economic model, um, is something that to a certain extent has been in the discussion for quite a while and it keeps on coming back in the discussion. How do we change things? How does the EU position itself in the world and so on and so forth? Uh, you're privileged to some extent because you've seen the private part and you've seen the national part as a former minister of labor. Uh, and now you see the, the EU decision making part. Um, what are the chances of success of this new model? Yeah, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. I would like to, uh, you know, um, uh, salute uh, uh, Florin Kutsu, the Minister of Finance. It's good to see him. Um, also, Siegfried, my colleague, we've been working quite hard these days. It's actually a privilege to be back in your alma mater. And um, um, this is a, a good occasion for me to uh, be grateful to the professors that I had, the colleagues, and to greet you all. Um, it's really good to, to, to be uh, here alongside you. Now, um, the topic related to the economic model, um, 
that that's that's something i mean i'm an idealistic uh and and you know it's it's for me it's actually crucial not to talk about only about the crisis uh right now and the conjuncture that we are having right now but to have a, a broader perspective to, to understand a little bit how how how, how the future um, will look like and and I would actually dare to say that the future will depend on how we we do things right now. So this is not about just waiting to see if there will be a second wave or a third wave or you know just waiting to 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 see what's happening, but it's more to be proactive as well and to try to imagine how the reality can actually be shaped. And again, many people have actually mentioned that this is a crisis too good to to waste. Now let me explain a little bit why I think that um, we are right now having in front of us you know very important choices for the future and and then uh, it, it is actually crucial to 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 do the the, the 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 right choices now what we know in terms of of, of data is that the summer forecast uh, suggested the minus 8.3 percent for the eu area um as a whole 2020 and then a recovery of 5.8 percent in 2021 but unfortunately the summer um forecast actually had an, the assumption that there will not be a second wave um, and there, there uh, will actually uh, be a slow um, uh, recovery going on. So I think that we are starting from uh, a situation that's quite dire, it's quite, quite difficult. What we can also see is that this is an unprecedented moment in the history of Europe in terms of solidarity and putting together resources and creating a particular perspective. So that's why I would say this is a crossroads for Europe as it is a turning point from Romania, for Romania as well. We are actually right now facing the symmetric shock of the crisis on both demand and supply. And, and I think that our minister has a very well ex expressed and, and explained how we've been uh, trying to address uh, these particular shocks uh, in recent times and what are the plans for the future. So we do have this conjunctural um, uh, crisis that is actually, you know, um, hitting us a lot. But we also have, you know, you know, deep structural problems of the Ro Romanian economy. Um, there was a path dependency and there is a path dependency in terms of resource allocation, in terms of, you know, the inefficiency that is actually, you know, the, the, the most important feature of, of, I would say, of, of, of the Romanian economy right now. And why I'm saying that, because, I mean, I, I, can, I can give you a metaphor. If you have a car that works on gas and you are keep on pouring gas in it, um, and you are expecting to have a longer mileage ahead, but the gas is actually hold, has holes in it. Then uh, basically what you're going to do is you are pouring gas at the expense, but then the gas is going to be wasted on the on the road. So th that's the problem. We, the R Romania should have, you know, should have actually done uh, much more in the last 30 years. Um, and unfortunately, um, we've actually, uh, just re realized uh, that that the, the holes that we had in our tank did not allow us to go that far. Um, and here, basically, we are referring to some structural strains and you know some some endemic problems of of the economy that are related basically to corruption, that are related to um, you know deviating uh, uh, public spending uh, in, in in areas that are not efficient, that are related not to have impact studies or you know competent people in the right places. Um, that are, I would say, related to the, to the general idea that there's a, there are a lot of free riders in the economy and a lot of exceptions and exemptions, and we don't have uh, an, an overall system of, of actually monitoring and having performance-based system. So, so the, the, the problem is that if we are actually going to do business as usual and consider the crisis only as being a conjunctural thing, you know, uh, you know, we need just to kick in the the, the anti-cyclical uh, 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 moves and you know put capital and, and, and public investment and then you know try to 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 pour the the gas in the tank and then you know keep the the, the engine running i mean we may actually end up in uh, a situation in which we will not actually go uh, too much of a mileage because again the holes of the tank and that's actually the most important thing that we need to realize in our society right now I'm not denying the fact that we need gas in the tank to restart the economy. I'm not saying that. This is, you know, part of the fundamentals, and Florin Kutsu is right, and, and we need to do that. But but if we are not using right now the momentum for the structural change, um, I mean, that would be a, a, a significant waste uh, of, of energy and resources, and, you know, the, the whole thing with indebtedness will actually hit us. Now, how we address the structural changes? I mean, 
I mean, let's not, you know, com, you know, make a confusion in between the things that we need to fix, such as, for instance, infrastructure, uh, you know, having the highways, having the railways, and so on and so forth, and the structural change, which means to, you know, change the pattern of, of the economy. And and of course, I mean, I am actually, um, I mean, not suggesting a Keynesian, you know, approach where you, or, or even worse, where we actually completely create out of the blue things. But I mean, when we were, we've been talking about incentives, I mean, you know, it's very, very important to understand that, that um, you know, there are a couple of incentives related to the, to the um, factors of production that we need to put forward. And I will start with finance. Um, so when we talk about finance, um, we have the old paradigm. The old paradigm was that the, the state is actually using public money and putting public money and then, um, um, when it's coming to, to, to help with the grant schemes and so on, it's more or less like the, the term that is coined as helicopter money. So you put money, you know, push uh, more or less the, the, the supply to, 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 to get, uh, you know, uh, their, their way. But the, the problem that we are actually facing right now is that we know that even with the European money, this would not be enough. And I actually was delighted to hear uh, Florian uh, um, Katsu mentioning the fact that we need the private sector on board in the structural change and, and indeed, we've been doing a, a lot of effort in the European Parliament to allow that the 30.5 billion that we are having in RF would actually be allowing to have partnerships with the private sector. And what I mean by partnerships with private sector, I mean that working together with the private sector in actually understanding what are what, what, what is the process of creative, creative destruction that we are in right now and to try to, to create the right buffers um, and, and the right safety nets to, to, to have a, 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 a correct allocation of resources. So if we talk about Pareto optimality, obviously we need the private sector in, and obviously what we need to do to deal is address the inefficiency because one thing, one thing is to put money and the other thing is to control how spending is going. If we put money into highways, uh, we've actually put money into highways in the past as well, but we didn't have highways. So, so I would actually go very, you know, adamantly on this question of, of, of efficiency and, and and countering waste. So these are these are actually um, a couple of things on, on on finance. Now on human capital. Now this is not business as usual again. So we are actually facing a digital transition. We are actually talking about technology uh, spikes, and and we need you know this upskilling and reskilling of population. The, the main goal in terms of human capital in Romania should not be to just preserve the jobs that we have, um, to preserve the low cost jobs that currently are actually um, in around 2 million out of the 5 million in the private sector, you know, on minimum wage. So what we need to do is to, to basically create jobs that are better paid and to take out of the gray areas you know activate more people in the in, in the labor market and and for that you need you know a structural change in the labor market in romania and this thing about digital skills about you know skills generally speaking about vocational training about you know investing in education this is something that if we don't do we will not be able to do anything but keep on you know pouring gas in in a, in a tank with holes because these are structural things now the next point that I would um, like to make, and you know, then uh, try to, to to move to to a closure. So the next point is the societal uh, paradigm that we, in which we are living, and, and this is actually very important. On, on one hand, um, we what we are doing right now in Europe, we are redefining um, the way in which economy is related to society. And when I'm talking society at large, I'm referring to, you know. To the nature, to, to you know, climate change, to energy resources, to the way in which we we eat, we live, we um, you know we are actually doing anything in in our day to day life. So this is actually a change that it's not you know meant just to, you know a little bit of change in the curricula in education, adding more digital hours or a little bit of you know fine tuning here and there. This is about how we imagine our life in you know, relation with, with, with nature and with climate and with, with, with the main challenges that we are facing. And, and this means that we need to build up um, you know, this cultural uh, thing related to um, how we would like to, to have our living and to raise our children. Now, another thing is the distributional effects. I mean, if we have about an economic model, then we need to look on how the impact of this model is distributed. And, and then we, we have right now a particular thing related to, you know, uh, the complete um, 
rethinking on the concept of well-being and of the fact that we have this major rift in between the haves and the have-nots. We have about one in three Romanian that are living in poverty right now, or it's actually um, in, in vulnerability related to, to a revenue income or disability of, or of some sort. And, and, and that's actually crucial to understand that if we are not going to have a, an inclusive society, you know, not necessarily redistributing money and, you know, paying a, a couple of uh, uh, hundreds of ron uh, in addition, but creating access and opportunity for those people to have <clears throat> an independent life, to actually be able to achieve what they want to do and to have just you know, the access and the opportunity that, that that's actually crucial. And we need to invest in, you know, community action and, and solidarity at that particular level. Um, and then we also have a problem of distribution that is about the generational gap. We are increasingly facing right now a problem related to the young generation versus the elder generation. And this is when we talk about pension reforms, that this is related <clears throat> to the different choices, you know, pro-environment or pro-digital. So what we need to do is to address that directly. We need to invest in, in a care industry that will actually provide active aging and will allow uh, elder people to, you know, our seniors to, 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 to keep getting involved in the society. Because so far what we are doing is we are marginalizing completely a good chunk of the society that is actually felt completely, um, you know, um, left aside of, of, of how the society is operating. And that's something that we cannot afford in this new model that, that I'm talking about. On the other hand, in terms of child, uh, children and youth, I mean, the kind of guarantees that we need to put forward are critical. And we talk about that in, at the European level, and we should talk about that in Europe, in Romania, because otherwise we will talk in the future about, uh, you know, we've been talking about Generation X, Y, Millennials, and so on. We will talk about the lockdown generation. So if we are not acting right now to avoid that, you know, to, to allow this generation to, 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 to take part in the society, we will have a problem. I will try to <clears throat> sum up by saying that um, this is not about, you know, survival from one day to the other. This is um, not about only about the conjunctural effects of the crisis. This is about redesigning and redefining the way we want to, to move forward. And again, um, th this is actually meaning the fact that we need to address the structural inefficiencies. We need to create stability, predictability, transparency, and cutting the red tape for the entrepreneurial sector to allow the entrepreneurship you, you know, um, uh, factor of production to be active and the innovative potential of that. And on the other hand, actually to go um, uh, much more in depth uh, in, in our society and to understand the way in which economic and social um, realms are connected or interconnected and, 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 and have a, a say on that. So I will say, indeed, the best possible thing, um, given the um, model that I, or the metaphor that I propose, um, may, I mean, the, the, a, a patch can be just to, to plug some, uh, something into the holes of the tank and, you know, try to, you know, get it along. Um, or it may be also useful to replace the tank. But, but again, if we still have the pebbles that can actually make, pierce the tank again, it's not a, a problem. So the solution may be, and metaphorically, it's actually quite, quite nice to go to an electric car. Then we don't need gas and we don't have a problem with the holes in the tank. So that's actually the kind of shift that we are actually facing it right now. We are actually talking about shifts of technology uh, of, of, of the way in which we, we would like to, to, to address our future that, that would actually allow us to be more efficient, to be less dependent on, on things that are harming nature and to actually um, be also much more uh, closer to the core of Europe in terms of you know, working at pan-European projects and you know, things with value added at that particular level. So this is my pledge right now, and I think that this is something that we should all, all of us economists should actually think about, that we should have the right mix in between fixing the things related to crisis, but then at the same time, you know, going with the ambition, going there with, with, the, with, the, with the will um, and everything that it takes to, 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 to implement a new model in a partnership with the private sector, in a partnership with the civil society, in a partnership that it will bring together people and build up that social trust, that nudge thing that is so much needed in order to, to get uh, in the end to the political trust as well and to move uh, the society ahead. Thank you very much. And, and again, I'm delighted to, to answer questions. 
Well, it was it was extremely uh, interesting that you have mentioned this heterogeneity at at European level uh, between different ages. I would say between different classes, although that term doesn't necessarily have the best connotation to a certain extent. But linking this recovery plan, this resilience plan, this new paradigm that you are mentioning with the Green Deal that uh, that Mr. Moreshan presented and uh, with the data that says that in Romania, at least in, term, in terms of... Um, a certain type of pollutant. We can't really talk about the industry as the culprit. We'll have to look at uh, the way heating is done in the rural areas, uh, at the way that heating is done in small cities, uh, at the way that people are polluting. Um, and that's a specificity of Eastern Europe. It's not necessarily a specificity of the of the EU globally. Um, how do you think, and that's a question for both of them, how do you think all these elements, all these uh, plates that we have juggling at the same time, uh, the paradigm shift in approach to climate, the need to rediscuss the model, the need to implement failure and become more resilient, the digital part, all these elements. Uh, how do you think we'll be able to tackle them without dropping any plates? Because if we drop any, you know, we can't really, we can't really move forward. So Dragos and then and then Zifri Noresha. Okay, so so basically the, the the whole point is that to, to, to first of all to accept that heterogeneity. I mean that's that's the most important part. I mean getting out of business as usual means to recognize that we are actually having multiple variables at the same time, and that there cannot be you know just one mastermind you know figuring it out. You know we need to have a collective action of some sort, and that's actually very very important. So we need to have the individual freedom to decide and to 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 to, to individual liberty to 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 um, you know cater for, for uh, its own life uh, his own life or her own life but at the same time to to understand that this is a process in which we need to 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 get closer together and that's actually uh, the, the thing that i'm advocating for in europe we are talking uh, not talking about anymore about helping companies one by one we are actually talking about supporting ecosystems uh, and this is actually a very important part of the new um, uh, industrial policy in Europe. This is about resilience. Resilience means the capacity to withstand shocks. And, and by that, we mean pre, you know, proactive movements towards the, you know, the way in which technology is evolving. So, so that's actually the difference that we, we, we are having right now between a reactive model that is just you know, trying to patch and fix things and a proactive model that is actually more or less trying to, to get there to the leadership that we need. So the industrial ecosystems that I've mentioned, I mean, they are actually, you know, a mix in between the multinationals that are coming, you know, uh, with uh, with their uh, scale economy and, and, and cost advantage, but then also embedding the local components of the ecosystem. It's the things that we've been talking in Romania for a long time, that we have investments, but they are like citadels. They are not actually doing, you know, having, we are not using their full potential for positive spillovers, yeah? Um, on the other hand, when you mentioned that it's about uh, the rural areas and snow, indeed, we have also the distribution effect in between urban and rural. But right now in Europe, we are talking about the renovation wave, which means to, to use this reform that we have as part of the Green Deal and energy efficiency to actually invest a lot in reducing the bill, the invoice for um, you know, vulnerable categories, you know, to do rehabilitation of housing, to, to, to actually go uh, much more beyond and in depth in terms of housing conditions. And, and we do have in Europe this thing with housing first. And that's actually a very important uh, issue to, to, to understand. There are so many things that are coupling together right now that are merging to, to, to create the opportunities that I was actually uh, talking about. And that's crucial. And I really like, like to emphasize, and I will end with that, the fact that the Green Deal and the digital transformation are not just about climate and digital. They are about new ways of you know 
becoming more independent from resources that are expensive and in Europe we are not going to be competitive you know in getting those resources um, as other blocks in the world so we need to understand the global competition and in terms of digital the crisis has actually provided us an enormous opportunity for a wider acceptance of the society that digital is part of the solution and it's actually something that will actually push us uh, forward in a better way so indeed there are many things to comment but this would be a couple of insights thank you Mr. Morashan. Look, I think the answer to your question is relatively straightforward. Uh, how can we manage uh, greening, digitalization and all other new priorities without you know, falling in between? I think the answer is, well, they are interlinked. Uh, and digitalizing goes hand in hand with uh, with greening. They are not opposed, they are not antagonistic, number one. Number two, as uh, decision makers in the public sector, we should embrace them, we should not oppose them. For example, when it comes to EU funds for our country, traditionally, the priorities have been the funds for agriculture and the cohesion funds. But the truth is that even these funds can contribute a lot to greening, to reducing carbon footprint, um, to digitalization, um, even in the rural areas, and Dragos was also hinting towards that. So um, the private sector has many ideas. We should, as the minister said before, you know, have them unleash their potential. And as public sector, we should not oppose this new European wave that is coming because, yes, we weren't strong in these areas, you know. Yes, we need the other countries to bear with us when it comes to the pace towards greening. We were not particularly um, good in some areas of digitali digitalizing in comparison to other countries. But the private sector has ideas, there are initiatives, there are entrepreneurs there. And we, as a, pub as a public sector, we have the choice to either, you know, try to... Um, reduce the pace for everyone at European level and keep uh, the Union in its traditional priorities, agriculture and cohesion, or, you know, um, support the Union in going towards new priorities, research, innovation, digital, um, improving energy efficiency, uh, and so on. Uh, support this wave, going into new priorities, obviously, you know, Obtaining derogations for us where needed, um, uh, asking the union to bear with us where we need more time. But you know, we should increase our capacities to absorb, uh, um, to be part of this, to absorb these resources, because otherwise the progress in the other countries is obvious and will be fast. Otherwise, we would just increase the discrepancy between other EU countries and ourselves. Well, and that we, is obviously. We actually have a question sort of in the same respect, um, because you have both touched upon that. What will be the social and economic impacts of the measure of cutting uh, GGEs on Romania. What do you think will happen? And thank you, Maria Voina, for the question. Uh, I, I mean, I can, I can, uh, I can go on that. Uh, so, I mean, we there, 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 there have been plenty of impact uh, assessments uh, in, in Europe. I mean, unfortunately, in Romania, we did not have you know a thorough study that would actually show the figures for that. But, but again, I would actually um, uh, say that um, the impact assessments are actually suggesting um, clearly that there is an opportunity ahead um, to, to do this, this transition, this conversion that would actually allow to create better paid jobs, uh, that will allow us to be more competitive at, 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 at global level, that will allow us to, you know, to create those pan-European value chains that are so much needed uh, in the future. I, I would actually suggest that we are right now in a situation that is actually very Schumpeterian. This is exactly about you know, the way in which Schumpeter has actually tried to describe you know, the, the, the impact of technology on, on, on society. Right now, um, with, the, with, the, with the new technologies that we have ahead, we can actually you know, jump and, and kickstart the economy to, to do by far better than what was in the past. I, I don't think that when you have actually watched how you know people that were leaving the country before the crisis um, because they they were not able to get a, a well-paid job because they were not able to have 
you know, proper um, for services and so on. We cannot just say that we we were fine. We were doing well. I, I would really insist on the fact that we have right now an opportunity to go with this wave and, you know, surf on top of it instead of, you know, just being resistant and suggesting that we need to, to conserve on, on, on some of the things that, that we've been doing in the past. Obviously, obviously, doing nothing is easier than doing, you know, the kind of things that the reform said that, that we, we are having ahead. And for that, you need, you know, the stamina, you need the, the, the vision, and, and you need, obviously, the will to, to go ahead. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I would ask Maria to stay tuned for, you know, the, the last half an hour of our panel, because we also have a presentation of a research project that's currently um, taking place in the uh, in our university, in the Center of Excellence in Foreign Trade, specifically about social and economic impacts of, of this thing. Um, building on this, we have a question for, for Mr. Murashan that is asking whether we're doing enough towards climate change. Uh, I would skip the first part about how important is the issue of climate change, but uh, go to the, to the latter, which is, are we doing enough or are we doing actually too much? Is it, you know, a, a bubble? Look, I think there has been a change in paradigm uh, over the course of the last year as well in Romania. And um, I feel that, you know, the government is listening to the people in the sense that we are seeing that there is now in Romania a critical mass of people which care about the environment, which understand the risk of climate uh, change, which listen to science and people who know exactly what we have to do both as individuals, what enterprises have to do, and they have very clear expectations also towards the uh, the uh, policymakers. People that know that you know, uh, every one of us, um, every one of us can contribute to reducing the CO2 emission through transport, but through also many other elements of our daily behavior, but that we need the public sector to provide us alternatives. I am ready to leave my car at home, but I need the right, uh, the right uh, public uh, transport system. So um, there is this essential critical mass of uh, people in the society, indeed particularly in the urban areas, indeed particularly amongst younger uh, voters, but they are active, they are outspoken, they are coherent, and uh, they have a voice. And uh, I think that, you know, the readiness in the public sector now to listen to them and to articulate public policies is there. And we've seen it before with the Minister of Finance. So I am, and you know, you have the Harris and myself together on the panel, I'm confident that you know we will have over the course of the next four years in Romania a government which embraces this uh, this topic um, uh, also because you know uh, the wave is clear and the voice of the people has been uh, clearer and uh, and louder so uh, um, we have seen so far denial in previous years at the level of the uh, at the level of the private sector but that i believe at the level of the public sector so we have seen denial at the level of the public sector but i would say that is now something of, uh, of the past and you know even the intervention of the minister this morning uh, convinced us he said very loud and clear you know we all want to go into that direction i haven't seen the government challenging that objective the president of the country um, even in the key decisions at the European level, he was not in the corner with the governments of Poland or Hungary or the Czech Republic on the blocking side. He said very clear, the long-term objective is that we become climate neutral by the year 2050. That means that we should not, um, we should not uh, um, have bigger CO2 emissions than what the nature can absorb by, by, itself, by, uh, uh, by itself. And we have embraced this objective. We were not in the minority of countries which were questioning, which were challenging it. And we are also ready, you know, to assume the intermediate paths towards that, because just setting a long-term objective, if you don't do the necessary in the medium term, uh, will, um, will not be enough. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, what, what's actually um, particularly interesting to me is the fact that regardless of the political groups in which you are all part of, today's conversation has proven yet again that we share a vision, at least in this, in this respect, 
And uh, mostly uh, that the Romanians in the parliament, in the European parliament, share a common goal towards Romania's development, uh, which, you know, sounds, sounds very uh, pompous, but it is. And this conversation has proven. Um, I would like to thank yeah, this was this was supposed to be the normality. Obvious. I mean, I mean, yeah, honestly, <laughs> it's not a surprise. I mean, I no, but you know, we're yeah. we're so unused to talking about normal things as normal. Uh, also, normality is abiding by our promise, which is to let you go and not make you too late for for your next meeting. I would like to thank both of you. Uh, we have some questions in the comments that we did not have the chance to answer uh you both have the chance of going on the facebook page of the of the faculty and answering directly to the questions if you if you didn't are like that exactly you you shall answer in writing um thank you so much i would like to keep our audience still tuned because we are joined by by vlad nero who is the phd uh candidate who is directing this thank hello you to both of you and go work for Romania. Um, Vlad, uh, you are conducting a research specifically on the economic impact of the, of the um, um, European Green Deal and on the social impacts of the European Green Deal. It is a research find, uh, financed by the uh, European Investment Bank. It takes place, as far as I know, for one year. And I would like you to take the next 10 minutes or so to walk us through that. It might answer some of the questions that we did not tackle with the two guests prior. Uh, I would ask you to go into full screen so we can share the screen as well. Okay, can you can you see my presentation in full Perfect. screen now? Now it works, the floor is yours. Okay, good morning ladies and gentlemen. My name is Vlad Nero and I'm a PhD candidate at the Bucharest University of Economic Studies and a re, uh, researcher on uh, European Investment Bank project named Sustainable Path of just transition for the coal regions in in Romania. And we all know, as was stated before, that the European Green Deal is a complex multi-dimensional transition process. And uh, we, in this research project, decided to focus our research on the two uh, coal dependence regions of Romania, because after a brief uh, analysis of the energy production mix, we observe that 97% of the energy generated from coal-fired power plants actually comes from only those two, two regions. And those regions are Sudwest Oltenia and West regions of, of uh, Romania. So even though the uh, the research, this, appro this research approach will uh, be narrowed down to only two, reason, to only two regions of Romania. This will allow us to have an in-depth analysis and come up with specific contextualized solutions and solutions and policy proposals. So in this, uh, the project will, will uh, stretch for one year. It started in June this this year, and we aim to to tackle four dimensions of the EU Green Deal. The first dimension will be the environmental dimension, because in our view, is actually the primary cause that sparked the need for a European uh, Green Deal plan. And the second the second dimension will be the energy. The energy dimension. We all, we already uh, started to see a reduction of fossil fuel usage and uh, an increasing uh, use of renewable sources of of energy. The third dimension will be the socio-economic dimension, and in my view, this is probably the most important part because it affirms the core values of Europe that nobody should be left behind. And of course, the Green Deal will have a high impact, especially on the regions that have 
an economic model built around the coal sector. So changing this model will put a lot of pressure on the regional and local labor market and on uh, household uh, welfare, especially in the short and mid term. And last and no, but not least, there will be the infrastructure dimension because investment in, uh, in new facilities and energy distribution grid will allow us to reduce some of the current inefficiencies like uh, energy losses on, on the grid. But given the, the short time that I have for this presentation, I will focused uh, main, mainly on pollution and economic structure of the Central and uh, East European uh, member states. So uh, all of the Central and uh, East European member states have a legacy of, let's say, the post-communist uh, uh, era, and we have a higher share of industry in GDP in comparison with our uh, Western counterparts. And the high share of industry is not a problem per se, but the problem emerges from the fact that most of the goods produced by the extractive industry and manufacture in Romania are low and medium gross value added goods. So that combined with a par share of industry in GDP is expected that we will consume more energy in order to produce, let's say, one billion worth of, of GDP. And conse consequently, we will have a higher level of green gas, green gas emissions. And the main air pollutants result, resulting from the combustion of coal, oil and gas are, are sulfur dioxide, particulate matter and nitrogen oxides. And I, as I stated before, 97% of the electricity produced by coal-fired power plants comes from West region and the Southwest re Voltenia region. And in comparison with our uh, 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 neighbors and the other uh, Central and East European uh, countries, uh, we have a very well-balanced uh, energy production mix with a high share of renewables. But coal still plays an important role, as we can see, 23.3% uh, of the energy produced uh, comes from coal-powered, uh, coal-fired power plants. And uh, coal plays a very important role uh, in the winter months because then the energy consumption peaks and almost 40% of the energy delivered in the system is from, from coal. So before we decide to reduce further the share of coal in our uh, electricity mix, we need to put something in place or else the dependency of energy imports will only, will only increase. We have done a cluster analysis to observe similar structural similarities of uh, economies for our, all the member states of the European Union. And as we can observe, Romania and uh, Czech Republic have the highest share of industry and construction as gross value added in GDP. We correlated the uh, gross value added as percent of GDP for the two uh, sectors, industry and construction for 2008 and 2018 period with the compound annual growth rate. And we can uh, observe that uh, the main air pollutants for all member states uh, have, uh, have been reduced from 2008 levels. The only exceptions in in this, uh, uh, the only exceptions are Hungary and Bulgaria, uh, with uh, respect to their particulate matter uh, emissions. So, in order to evaluate the current pollution levels and uh, the target set by the the member states, these are, these are the data from the European Environment Agency, we can observe that uh, Romania is facing difficulties in reaching uh, the nitrogen oxide uh, target and particulate matter 
target. And from uh, the perspective of the energy sector, energy production sector in regard with particulate matter this sector ha has not a significant significant impact it had a, uh, a significant impact in 2005 but the pollution the emissions were uh, uh, significantly reduced and in terms of uh, nitric oxide pollution, Romania's strategy provides for the completion and commissioning of two more nuclear units, the third and the fourth nuclear reactors of Chernavod nuclear power plant, uh, each with an installed capacity of 720 megawatts. So one of these uh, reactors should be put in operation until 2013, and this will allow us to temporary closure uh, other, the temporary closure of other capacities for modernization and refurbishment and even the, the, the decommissioning of highly polluting and unprofitable facilities and thus making uh, more reliable the transition to an energy sector with lower green gas emissions. And now I would like to go to a more in-depth analysis and a comparison with uh, with the other members, uh, the other Central European member member states. So there are more scenarios, but for this presentation, we choose the scenario with, where the two energetic complex will be completely closed. This is not the most plausible scenario, but for for the sake of argumentation, we would like to see how much the pollution would, will be reduced if those two uh, energetic complexes would be would be closed. So as we can see for the uh, nitrogen oxide emissions, there was a substantial reduction from the period of admission to the European Union, uh, mainly because the share of uh, electricity produced by coal-fired power plants have decreased for from 40 5% in 2007 to 23% in 2019. Also higher efficiency filters were uh, were introduced to the coal-fired power plants still operating today, diminishing even for further the NOx uh, emissions. But even with a complete closure of those two energetic complexes, the reduction will be only of 15.25 gigagrams. That that would would put us still far away from from the target. And as we can see, the main factor that could uh, help us get closer to the 2013 target is the transport uh, sector. But we should take into account that even uh, if engine that 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 engine emissions regulation has become tighter, the number of Passenger cars in Romania have has increased significantly in the period of 2007, the admission period of Romania, when the number of passenger cars were, was 3.5 million cars. At today levels, there are 6.5 million cars, so almost doubling. So, in conclusion, a, a better road infrastructure, including a higher number of electric changing charging stations and the shift towards more efficient engines engines and a uh, higher share of electric cars will have a more consistent impact on NOx emission reduction than the closure of uh, CO and CAH. Going to the pollution, uh, SO2 pollution, which is actually where the largest sources of SO2. Uh, Romania's heavy industry and heating system was based on a large proportion on thermal energy resulting from coal burning. And SO2 was, uh, and the uh, fossil fuel sector was uh, a high factor of pollution in, it had a, a high share of pollution in the post-communist and pre-admission admission era. Uh, following the admission to the European Union and the implementation of pollution regulation, SO2 emissions have been reduced significantly. Uh, just for the 
to have an order of uh, measurement, uh, you should know that in 2007, the value of SO2 pollution was 516 gigagrams, more than six times uh, more than, than today today's levels. But Vlad, I, Vlad I'm, I'm going to jump in because the research is definitely interesting. However, we want to leave people, you know, with the with the taste for more. So, if you tell them uh, if they have further questions, where can they contact you? Uh, my uh, email address is Vlad. Uh, point. Uh, I, do, I do know that you have it on the last slide. Yes, yes. Uh, if you want me to put it here, is this is the uh, the. Uh, the email address. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for this wonderful presentation. I'm sorry we don't have more time to dedicate to it. Um, I would like to, to uh, remind our, um, our audience that we will have about 10 minutes break between this plenary and the next plenary. So join us at 12 Bucharest time for the second plenary of the day focused on the financial system. Um, I would like to thank my panelists. It has been quite an interesting conversation. I hope so too. Uh, don't forget that you will be able to follow back on this conversation on our Facebook page. Uh, last but not least, as is the case, I would like to thank our partners and our sponsors and our media partners for uh, supporting this entire thing. Thank you so much. Join us in 10 minutes for our next plenary. Have a great day.